Joshua chapter 13 is where we'll begin. <clears throat> My message though is going to be really dealing with a portion of this book. We made it to that section uh, that is dealing with the dividing up of the land. And so tonight in, in uh, light of what's uh, within these chapters, I want to speak to you about the truth about claiming Canaan, the truth about claiming Canaan. We've been talking about our inheritance and how uh, it involves as far as uh, what's on this side of heaven, uh, having a fruitful life. Galatians chapter 5 lists what uh, that fruit is. We won't go over all that again tonight, uh, but it is something that uh, uh, is an abundant life, and every life that would be filled with that, it wouldn't matter what size house they lived in, what size bank account they had, what kind of car they drove. Uh, if you've got a life that's filled with the Spirit of God and you're bearing the fruit of the Spirit of God, you've got an abundant life. And you can just go down the list there in Galatians chapter 5 and check that off. That's what everyone's looking for anyway. Uh, a, lot, a lot of folks think they're going to have those things by making money or having nice things or getting to a certain title and life or whatever. And it doesn't come that way, friends. It only comes from the Spirit of God. And so we're talking about claiming your Can Canaan in that light, having your inheritance and enjoying it uh, as far as the borders of your life is concerned. Notice it says here in chapter 13, <clears throat> verse 1, uh, Joshua chapter 13, verse 1, says, uh, Now Joshua was old and stricken in years, and the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years. <laughs> and what did you expect him to say? Man, it's impossible for God to lie, even when it hurts. Amen. But here's the problem God is prefacing. Notice, and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. Now, if you'll just go back a page there, look uh, at chapter 11 and verse 23. Uh, there's a place there that some will uh, consider that there's a contradiction from what we just read in the first verse of chapter 13 with chapter 11 and verse 23. Look there if you would. It says in chapter 11 verse 23, So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord said unto Moses. And Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel according to their divisions by their tribes. And the land rested from war. So you look at those two verses there and what's being said and you ask, what's going on? I mean, did they take all the land or not? Because obviously in one place it says they did and then, and then over a chapter there it shows us that they didn't. And someone says, well, there's a mistake. There's a contradiction. Obviously there's no mistake. There's no contradiction. As a matter of fact, uh, there is a very good lesson behind all this that every New Testament child of God needs to take to heart. And what's happened is that they're going through the land and they're occupying major portions of the land in those areas. Uh, even though they've, they've won major battles against those inhabitants who were uh, their enemies. Uh, they haven't completely run out all those enemies out of those places. There's still some uh, that are dwelling in those obscure places. Uh, but Israel yet definitely did take control and so it becomes their land. Uh, so because they're occupying it, it's, it's all theirs. And uh, yet because that there's still some of the enemy that's left there, they're not through and there remains much to be done. Now the problem is at this point, Joshua is old and stricken in years, and things get to the point that it says the land was resting from war. And the problem is that uh, they're not through. They're not through, and, and yet this is a tendency. This is a tendency, if you think now personally and make an application, that we all have in regards to uh, the matter of dealing with the enemy and claiming our own inheritance. Uh, we'll just go far enough, amen, we'll go far enough and, and get out of the red, just enough to get out of trouble and then we'll begin to coast. Yeah. Now, uh, coasting. Coasting is only possible whenever there's momentum. You can only coast when you have momentum. And, and I like it whenever I have momentum in my Christian life. I do. I, I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled whenever there's things that are just, uh, they're just obviously going in the right direction and you can just sense there's, uh, there's an advantage in your days and, and God's blessing and things are coming together and you're just able to go and live off the meat that God provided for you. You're able to go in that strength for quite a while and, uh, and you feel fresh. 
and your spirit feels renewed. And, and, and you can even say that it's akin to a personal revival that you've experienced. And that's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful place to be in in life. Uh, but the tendency then is just to start to coast and just sort of live off of that momentum. Now, momentum is important, and, and, uh, and you only can have it when you know you're giving it your all, and then things sort of pan off. And they pan off, and maybe they even start to go downhill. And understand when I say they start to go downhill, I'm not talking about it's going bad. I'm talking about that the landscape in front of you is, is not going to require a lot of effort. Uh, it's not going to take everything you've got for a little while here. And you're able to coast because things are, as I said, starting to go downhill there. And uh, you're not having to give it your all. You're able to get a breather, if you will. And that's a good thing. Rest is important. Yeah. Rest is important. Psalm 16, 9, speaking of rest, it says that we're to rest in hope. Psalms 37 verse 7 says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not thyself because of Him who prospereth in His way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Rest is good. Remember what the Lord said in the great invitation. He said, Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then he likens that rest that he imparts to us to his service. That is, he says, take my yoke upon you. Now, that's an instrument for service. And the Lord says, you want to rest? Get in this yoke with me. Amen. And he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Uh, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. And it says during the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus that happened that as those apostles were sent out and they were able to, they had those apostolic signs and wonders that accompanied their ministry. They came back and, and the Bible says in Mark chapter 6 verse 30 they began to tell the Lord as they gathered with Him about all the things they were able to do and all the things they were able to say. And here's what the Lord said to them. He said, uh, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. These are men that have been working for him. And he says, come apart and rest a while. And, and there it says, there had been, the Holy Spirit injects, there had been many coming and going. And they had no leisure as much as to eat. I mean, that's what happens from time to time, brethren. In the work of God, it happens. In the life of Christ, here was one that had the answers. And there were people out there that had the problems. Yeah. Here was the solution to all their problems, and everyone was talking. And so whenever he went, it was, the Bible, the Holy Spirit says, noised abroad. Yeah. Boy, it got to going, and suddenly people that had life and death situations, they were coming to him. Yeah. And so these men that were serving with him, I mean, they couldn't even sit down to a meal without somebody coming in and interrupting or some need arising and they're constantly on the go and that's the way it works. I mean you go through stretches where you can't even sit down to eat. I mean it's just up and go and up and go and it's just like that and the Lord says to these men, He says, come apart. Come apart and rest for a while. The Apostle Paul gets saved in Acts chapter 9. And here's what the Holy Spirit says in Acts 9, 31. It said, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, they were multiplied. So rest is good. <laughs> Uh, we need rest. And, and again, we're able to have it and enjoy rest whenever that momentum builds and it's built up in the effort and the work uh, that we put in. And we have circumstances in front of us where, as I said, they're sort of panning off there and the task ahead are sort of uh, downhill where it's not going to take a lot of effort. And, and then we can just plan having a good rest with God, coming apart and having a good rest with Him. The Lord's example to all of us in this is in Genesis chapter 2. And what it says there in verse 1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended His work which He had made. And He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had made. Now the Lord coming here to this, uh, this uh, time of rest for Him on the seventh day, He's an example to us in all this. He rested, and uh, He rested when? It was time to rest. And that's important. In other words, he didn't, he didn't get in the middle of something and take a break. He didn't, uh, you know, he didn't get right to the end there and decide to, to rest there. There was, uh, there was a time in which the Lord sat apart for him to rest, and it was the right time. And that's important there. It, it didn't interfere with his work. 
It didn't hinder his work there. It didn't prevent him from finishing. It was the right time. As a matter of fact, it was such a, a the right time that God sanctified that time. And he sanctified that time and he, he set it aside as a sign, he said there, uh, between him and the nation of Israel under that Old Testament covenant there uh, that he made with his people. And he ordained that time to be a rest for them. And so he set that apart. The Lord rested. So rest is not a bad thing. Rest is a good thing. And we could even go as far as say rest is a godly thing. Amen. Amen. But the purpose of rest is to refresh us. The purpose of rest is to supply us and fortify us towards what? Towards finishing the job. Towards keeping at it. Amen. It's not, rest is not to produce laziness. And rest does not, uh, uh, it's not to produce irresponsibility and the sinful reaction to rest will do just that. The, the sinful reaction will be to view rest just for that. Now I say sinful reaction, I'm afraid I'll lose you. Let me just say it this way, the natural reaction. And you know we all have a natural reaction. And our natural reaction is sinful. And the, the natural reaction to, is to view rest as just a, uh, to endorse laziness and irresponsibility, amen. And listen, that's, a, that's an indulgence of the flesh. And boy, you, you do that, you start pampering that flesh. Boy, you know what it wants, it wants more. <laughs> and before long, man, you're, you're just, amen. it gets easy and what happens? You get better? No, you get worse. It gets easier, it gets lighter and it feels heavier. And every little thing becomes a big thing. Because you're not wanting to fool with anything because you're not looking to work. You're looking not to. <laughs> And you've had rest, but you've not got a mind there that says, I need to get back to work. And, and what rest is for is rest is to fortify us and supply us and get us ready to go back to work. Uh, I just had the a blessing of getting away with my family. We got away. And we got away for a week. And it was good, just me and the family. But I didn't go there to sleep late and do nothing. Amen. I was trying to tell some of you that because I don't want to endorse that for anybody. Uh, my family's here. I took a box full of books and uh, uh, my computer and my Bible and, and I worked every day. And you say, why? Because, you know, I was at a point where I'm using Monday to get ready for Monday night and Tuesday to get ready for Tuesday night and Wednesday to get ready for Wednesday night and Thursday to get ready for Thursday night and sometimes Friday for Friday. And it was just like that. And I'm, amen, my, I, my, I'm at low ebb. And what I needed was what? To come apart and get some rest. Amen. Not to do nothing, amen. Not to just, just lay around, but to get ahead. <laughs> to get some things ahead there to where we can come back and we can hit it running, amen. And that's, a, of course, it's a blessing, amen, that uh, I can be gone. Nothing misses a step around here and, and come back and it's just all the same, amen. Things are going on. And that's a blessing. And my point is nobody uh, looks for rest. I mean, we shouldn't look for rest in order to quit working, amen. amen. We should look to rest to, in order to strengthen us towards continuing to work and, and continuing to finish what God's trusted us to do. And let me tell you something, folks. Our, our rest is in the Lord. Amen. That needs to be properly defined. You see, when we talk about coming apart, I want, to, I want you to understand, like Wednesday night, you know what you've done? You've come apart. Yeah. Here's Wednesday night. Well, this doesn't feel like a break to me, but it is. You're not on the job. Amen. Amen. You're not swinging a hoe right now. You're not digging a shovel. Amen. You're not running a computer. You're not sitting at a cash register. Uh, amen. You're not doing any of those things. You know what you're doing? You're sitting on a padded pew. Yeah. And you're hearing the Word of God preach. And this is no effort at all. Right. Yeah. You did the right thing in coming to church. And I know you're physically tired. But this is part of coming apart. Yeah. And as one man said, he said, we better learn to come apart and rest or we're going to come apart at the seams. And so we got to know what rest is for and we got to understand it. But rest is in the Lord. And, and the Lord's rest is never an endorsement of laziness or irresponsibility there. And uh, we will get to a point where we need rest. We will get to a point where we need a break uh, and a time of coming apart from everything else that's going on. But understand this, it is not a rest from the Lord you need. You don't need a break from God. You don't need time away from the Scriptures, ever. You don't need time off from walking in the light, brethren. That's where rest is found. Rest is found in the Lord. There may be things going on in the Lord's work that you need to pull away from from time to time. 
uh, because you're overwhelmed, but you never pull away from Him. You need to make, make sure that the mind don't play tricks on you there. The Bible says in Isaiah 40, verse 29, He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, He increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But the, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, and shall mount up with wings as eagles, that they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. And friends, we all need good rest, and biblically rest is good, and rest is from God, uh, but, but rest scripturally follows work. Yeah. Amen? It follows work. Amen. And my point being, I've known somebody in particular, they just, they need a break every other day. <laughs> Amen. Amen? I mean, they need a break. Had a bad week, need a break. And you get like that, well, you just need a break all the time, need a break all the time. You, there's no rest. You're not resting. You're being slothful. Right. And slothful, there is no resupply for someone who's slothful. Right. It's the Lord that gives us strength. And He's not going to bless a lazy man. Right. He's not going to endorse slothfulness. Amen. You're going to reach and get it, and He's going to bless you for doing so. Now, uh, the fact is that we've got to have momentum built up before we can truly rest. And uh, we come to a point in our lives towards, you know, our responsibilities, and we look ahead and we say, all right, now, I'm able to take a break right here. There's really nothing going on right here, and I can take a break. I can take some rest there. Everything's going to be taken care of there. And it's just like I say, sort of like cycling downhill. You've, you've got up to the top of the hill, now you started downhill. And it's going to take less effort, amen? <laughs> You can kind of enjoy that period in your life and you can get a breather right there. Uh, but again, that rest is not to cease from working and it's not to forget the responsibilities we've been entrusted with there. It's for the purpose of refreshing us and helping us to get focused again so that we might work and we might continue to strive for the things God has committed to our trust and finish what it is He's told us to do. And here, here's my point, folks, tonight, uh, that the tragic mistake is that a lot of folks, they work and they get to a point uh, and I'm talking spiritually now in this context where they, where they can coast a little while. And God has blessed them with some meat there that they can go in that strength for a little while there. And, and then they, they start coasting. And, it, and while they're coasting, they start to become lazy and irresponsible. And they end up losing that momentum. Because they took too long getting back to work. Yeah, and they lose that momentum. And, and they come to a point in which they're no longer coasting. Amen. And they're no longer headed downhill. Now things are starting back uphill. And what happens now is it's going to take more effort. It's going to take more effort, and, and really, it's going to take more effort to go back at it. Uh, you know, it would, have, it would have taken as much if they got back at it when they were supposed to get back at it, but because they procrastinated and put that thing off there, uh, it's going to take more effort sometimes, more than they're willing or even capable of giving. Yeah. They waited too long. And they're going to lose all their momentum. And they're going to end up coming to a complete stop because all they were doing was coasting. And tragically, they're going to end up, you know, ceasing. They're going to end up ceasing in any progress that they've been making in the work of God and any progress they've been making spiritually uh, in their walk with the Lord. Here in chapter 13, it says, Joshua was old, stricken in years, and the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. And again, things got to a point where just enough land had been possessed. Just enough battles had been won. Uh, just enough progress had been made. And what were they able to do? They're able to coast for a while. And that's good, but things are about to start uphill again. Yeah. And as things start uphill again, here's Joshua. He's, he's old and stricken in years. And folks, no matter how much land has been possessed and how many battles have been won, there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. There's still a lot of work to do. And the Lord's saying, hey, rest is over. <laughs> it's time to get back to work. It's time to get back at it. And folks, if we don't go back at it, whenever He says to go back at it, then uh, we may never get back at it again. Amen. Amen. I hope y'all are awake for that. Amen. <laughs> Because you rest, and that's good, but then the Lord says get back at it, and if you don't, you lose that momentum. And then after a while, it just all comes to a halt. And you just dread doing anything. Amen. That's what happens. Yeah. That self-indulgence, just it brings out the worst in us. And uh, again, if you don't get back at it, we may never get back at it again. Because we've lost that momentum, and now it's all uphill. Yeah. And someone, it's just easier to do nothing for them at that point there. And the, the, the fact is that 
some of the enemy we may have left within the borders of our life because we wanted to coast a little while and we wanted to rest for a little while. That thing may grow in our life and fortify and become a stronghold to the point you may never get it out. Amen. Amen. Uh, what am I doing tonight? I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm trying to warn you. Right. Amen. Because this is what happened with Israel. Yeah. They left the enemy in their land and coasted until all momentum came to a stop. Yeah. And then you read the book of Judges. Yeah. Because what happened was the enemy was still in the land and it just progressed from bad to worse till finally those folks are being driven out of their own land in places and they're being put to tribute by the enemy that's in their land. And they're not enjoying their inheritance as God intended. Now, no matter how old you are, amen, no matter how long you've been at it, no matter how many battles you've fought and won and how many enemies you've overcome there within the borders of your life, no matter how much progress has been made, you know what the truth is? There's still much work to be done. Amen. amen. There's still a lot of the land of your life that you're going to have to possess. Amen. And you don't ever have it down. Amen. You've got to deal with some things. And, and that attitude of that's enough. That attitude of that's good enough there. That's just going to absolutely do some people in. Yeah. Because they're just satisfied with themselves at a certain point in life. And they're satisfied to coast from here on out. Yeah. And they're going to say, well, that's enough. That's good enough there. And I, I'm not talking about becoming obsessive, amen. I don't want to endorse that kind of stuff and being a perfectionist where everything just got to be the very best. You know, there's some folks that can't have anything out of order or anything. I, I've known folks, they couldn't pass out a, a certain track because it wasn't the track they wanted. You know? <laughs> People take these tracks and they don't take these tracks. And, you know, well, you just do with what you can, amen. amen. Just be flexible. And you don't have to have the best of everything to do something for God. Amen. Do with what you got. And, uh, and, and, you know, some folks, it's just their life. They just try to be perfectionist there. And that, they'll drive themselves crazy amen. because life's not that way. Amen. And you got to learn to adjust. You can read in that Bible and you'll see there where Paul the Apostle, there's times there where he's thinking about doing something and he doesn't get to do it. And he's got plans, and he gets hindered by Satan. Yeah. And sometimes things come up, and they providentially hinder him from doing what he had plans on doing. And he had to, he had to come up with plan B. Amen. So it's good to be flexible, amen? It's good to have a plan B, uh, but we're not talking about that. We talk about people just satisfied with themselves way too early. Yeah. And because they don't care, they don't think the Lord cares. And he does care. I mean, they, they're satisfied with a weak and a dying prayer life and a malnourished soul and having no delight for the things of God, no delight for the Word of God. And they're satisfied with never having one one person to Jesus Christ and never even trying. Amen. Never even witnessing. But that's not a big deal. They look at their life and they examine their life. And because there has been no scandal and there has been no collapse in morality, they're satisfied. Yeah. God's standards are a little bit higher than that, friend. Amen. 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 So, well, I'm faithful to my wife. I do right by my kids. I'm f faithful to my job. Well, amen. Good. Let's give you a cookie. You know, <laughs> but you're supposed to be faithful to your wife. Amen. You're supposed to be good to your kids. You're supposed to do your job. Amen. amen. There's lost people that's done that. Amen. amen. What have you done for Jesus Christ? Amen. You go, well, I'm just, you know, I don't, I'm not a preacher. See, no, but you're satisfied. Yeah. And you're never going to do nothing for Him. Amen. Because you're happy with the way you are. You're, you've coasted to an absolute stop. Yeah. And you're fine with it. Amen. And the thought of getting going again yeah. is just more than you want to think about. You don't even want to entertain the thought because you know it's uphill from here on out. Amen. And there's folks, boys, listen, they, they do exactly this. They, they start looking at other folks and they compare their lives to other folks and they're okay by them, so they're okay. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, For we dare not to make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. That is, they're satisfied. Yeah. He says, But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Right. Some are happy with a powerless life because they're comparing themselves to people that live a powerless life. Right. And they're satisfied with a fruitless life that has nothing of the Spirit of God in it except that they're saved and going to heaven. They have assurance of that, but there's nothing of the fruit of the Spirit in their life. And they're happy with that because they're looking at other people and their fruitless life and they're measuring out all right. 
Now, God said in His Word, He commissioned us to abound. Yes, sir. That is a Bible-believing perspective right there. To abound. To abound. I, I have to learn to live with the truth. I, I don't have enough God in my life. Right. I have to learn to live with the truth that, listen, I'm not satisfied. I need more of Him. I need more of the meat of the Word. I need more of the milk of the Word. I, I need to seek His face more. I need more of Him. Yeah. I've got to learn to live with that truth. The Bible speaks of abounding in joy. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2. And that's in the context of abounding in sacrificial giving, grace and giving. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7. That's connected to abounding in the consolations of Christ. Also found in that context there. And you, you start to figure this out. That, that Once you start to focus on abounding in one thing, it leads to abounding in others because there's so many things that are connected in this life and this way of faith. Get 1 Corinthians chapter 15 real quick tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Bible talks about in Philippians chapter 1 verse 9 of abounding in love. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3, it shows that that's connected to... Uh, our faith, it, it happens when our faith groweth exceedingly. You start to abound in love when your faith starts to grow exceedingly. Think about that. Your love starts to abound when your faith starts to abound. Galatians 5, I, I hope you've read it before. It says that there's a faith which what? Worketh by love. It works by love. And, and your faith begins to abound. And that love, that charity begins to abound. And so the Bible talks about abounding in faith. While you're in 1 Corinthians 15, here's what Paul spoke to the saints at Colossae about. He said he was absent in the flesh and present in the spirit there. And he says that this, he says he was joined and beholding their order and the steadfastness of their faith in Christ. And then he says this, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Rooted and built up and established in the faith, as you've been taught, abounding therein, with thanksgiving. That's, that's, not getting, that's, that's never getting to the point where that's good enough. Right. Abounding. Right. Amen. Trusting God more. Right. Leaning more on those everlasting arms as we sing. Faith is the substance of what? It's the substance of things hoped for. And so as we begin to abound in faith, what else should happen? We should abound in hope. Amen. Right? Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. And so if we abound in faith, we'll abound in hope. The Bible says in Romans 15, 13, The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. He's talking about abounding. Amen. Amen. You may need to coast sometimes. You may need to rest sometimes. But you know what? There's a time when you better start kicking it again. Yeah. You better get back at it. Amen. Because if you wait till your coast comes to a stop, you'll lose all momentum. And then it's hard to get started back again. And a lot of folks never do. They never get started back in. There's a lot of folks, they had a lot of momentum at one time, and then they died on a church pew. Yeah. And they think because they're still in church, they're not dead. Yeah. But there's no momentum. There's no abounding. They are where they were 15 years ago. They are where they were 20 years ago. And the Lord wants us to abound. He wants us to have the mind to abound. And here's the fact, folks. If you're not abounding in hope, you're not going to do anything. Amen. 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 Uh, listen, there ain't anybody. You talk about a, a planting a garden. You're not going to plant a garden without hope. Amen. right? Who's going to get out there and clear off a piece of property and turn that soil and break it up tilling and, and fertilize that ground and then drop seed in it and wait for it to come in and start pulling weeds and trying to roll, run out the rodents and chase off the birds uh, to protect that seed? If You're not going to do that if you don't think anything's going to come from what you plant in that ground. Amen. And hope is anticipation. Hope has to deal with expectation. What are you waiting to happen from what you've done? Right. Amen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Yeah, man. You're not going to pray without hope. Amen. Who's going to take the time to pray about anything if you don't think God ever answers your prayers? That's right. And why, why are you going to read the Scriptures if you don't think God has something to say to you or something to show you? Right. And why would you come to church if you're not going to meet with God and worship God and, and get edified and built up or maybe reproved and helped? No one's going to go to church if they are not expecting something from God. They're not going to read their Bible if they're not expecting something from God. They're not going to pray if they're not expecting something from God. They're not going to give if they're not expecting something from God. What is that expectation? It's hope. Amen. It's hope. And faith is the substance of things hoped for. And as we abound in faith, 
We abound in hope. And look here at 1 Corinthians 15, 58, the last verse. Therefore, my beloved brethren, and this is the whole chapter is about the resurrection. And he's talking about our blessed hope there at the end. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. You know what happens, friend? Listen, you abound in faith, then you're abounding in hope. When you're abounding in hope, you're abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Because you think something's going to happen when you pass out a track. <laughs> You think God's listening when you're bowing on your knees and talking to Him. Nobody else is listening. It's you off in your prayer closet. But you know He's listening. Amen. Amen. You, you realize you haven't wasted an hour there off alone there with God because God's been listening to what you had to say. Amen. And then you open up that book and you begin to read that book. Amen. And it may just be a list of names. But hope says I'm getting something. <laughs> He's sharpening me up. Amen. And if nothing else, I'm, I'm walking in obedience. I'm reading it because he, he told me to. Amen. And hope, amen, maketh not ashamed. Yeah. It'll encourage you. Hope will encourage you. And you'll abound in the work of the Lord because you're abounding in hope. When, when you hope, you'll strive for something. You'll strive for something. And that, that happens. What happens when you begin to lose faith? When you begin to wane in faith? You begin to waver? You're not unmovable now. You're, you're unstable. Right. You're not established in the faith. So if you're not established in the faith, you're, you're unstable and it leads to falling away. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And, and not only are you not abounding now, you know what you're doing? You're falling back. Right. You start to backslide. This thing doesn't work at a standstill, folks. Amen. What I'm trying to tell you tonight, and I hope you take this home with you, and I hope the Lord just slaps it on your face like a spiritual tattoo. Amen. And you can't forget it. As soon as you say, that's good enough, you start a backwards decline. Because you don't rise up supernaturally in your spirit and stop. What goes up <laughs> must come down. And brother, what you got to do is keep abounding. <laughs> keep climbing by the grace of God. And learning and growing, amen? And getting stronger and making progress. Because just as soon as you think, well, that's good enough, you go backwards. You start to lose ground. And the opposite of 1 Corinthians 15, 58 takes place. Meaning instead of being steadfast and unmovable and abounding in the work of the Lord, you coast. And then you quit coasting. Yeah. Then you come to a stop. And then you fall away. Yeah. Brother, that's the story. Amen. That's the story why people don't finish the race. Amen. That's why they don't finish the fight. Mm -hmm. Amen. It's because they just coasted, came to a stop, yeah. and eventually fell away. Amen. It gets easy to become defensive during that time. Amen. You know what we talked about before? Amen. It happens. They get in. Boy, they're excited. And boy, it's, man, we had a great time at church. And our preacher, boy, he preached the Word of God. And, I mean, doctor, they may not even have things down yet. They may... He talked about things I don't even know what he's talking about. But boy, it was good. <laughs> and then later on, they start to get hardened. And then and it's no longer our church. It's those people. And it's no longer our preacher. It's that preacher. It's them. It's him. And there's this distance that takes place. And I don't know what they think. And I don't know who they think they are. And after a while, you don't even want to be around them. And what Satan has successfully done is he's come in there to a pile of coals that's burning hot and he's just taking you away from them and you just try it out see what happens when you take a coal from the burning there see what happens it'll lose its fire these over here will be alright but this one right here will smolder and die and get dark again and that's what happens to you and I just as soon as Satan can just get us in the wrong frame of mind and it's them and those and him and not us anymore not the people of God and you start to lose ground you got to bound, hey man. You got to have that mind, that mentality of going further, of getting higher, of doing more, of reaching more, yeah. of becoming more, abounding, abounding. And if we won't, not only will we not abound, then we will begin to get unsettled, and we'll begin to lose ground and start sliding back. Again, it said, Joshua was old and stricken in years, and the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years. And there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. 
know what God was saying? God saying to Joshua about all of Israel, He's saying, you and these guys, you're not through yet. Amen. Folks, that's what I'm preaching about tonight. The truth about claiming Canaan is... You're never through. Amen. It doesn't matter how many battles you've won, how many prayers you've seen answered, uh, what you've given, how many times you've read through the Bible, what doctrine you know. Amen. doesn't matter. You're never through. Amen. The light at the end of the tunnel. Amen. That's, that's the light at the end of the tunnel. The goal line is the end of the thing. Amen. We're not just trying to survive till tomorrow. Amen. We're looking to end the race. Yeah. And while we're going, brother, we don't want to lose momentum. We want to gain some. Amen. We want to abound. Amen. You don't want to just go on the last meal you had. You want some more meat from God. You want some more light from God. You need more fire from God. Amen. And that will only come as you diligently seek His face and abound in faith. Yeah. Because you start to abound in faith, which is, again... Without faith it's impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God, somebody who lives in faith will come to God, must believe that He is. He don't second guess it. Amen. He's confident. And that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. That's the life of faith. Amen. Where you just, you got to have Him. Yeah. Amen. you just got to have Him. And there's this all out pursuit of the Lord. And you're after Him. You want to know more about Him. You want to get closer to Him. When you start to abound in faith, you start to abound in hope. You start to abound in hope. You start to abound in the work of God. You start to abound in the work of God. You start to abound in the grace of giving. You start to abound in the consolations of Christ. You start to abound in the love of the brethren. It just works that way. But you know what happens when you quit? <laughs> you come to a halt. And all those areas in your life where you made progress, you start to lose ground. And pretty soon, the life you're living, you look back on it, it doesn't even resemble the direction you used to be going in. That's the way this thing goes, folks. It's not how you were born. It's not how you were raised. This is a supernatural lifestyle we're talking about where the fruit of the Spirit of God is present in our life. And any progress that's made is made through Him and by Him. It's through our obedience. I mean, we're not talking about just autopilot. <laughs> Amen. We're not, there's a lot of good cliches. I wish they were true. <laughs> Just let God. <laughs> I wish it was like that. You're going to have to follow Him. Amen. You're going to have to deny yourself. Amen. But, but that supernatural fruit that's born in your life will come from Him, sure enough. Amen. And that strength will come from Him, sure enough. Amen. And Christ, he, Paul said, It is Christ that liveth in me. That's the life I now live in the flesh. That's what he said. And, and folks, that's that life that God wants us to have because that pleases Him. Now he goes on to say right here, uh, verse 2, This is the land that yet remaineth, all the borders of the Philistines and all uh, Geshuri. And, and he goes on down there and he lists those places. Look at verse 6 real quick. Verse 6, All the inhabitants of the hill country from Lebanon unto uh, Miseroth, Foth, Maim, and all the Sidonians, them will I drive out from before the children of Israel. Only divide thou it by lot unto the Israelites for an inheritance as I have commanded thee. Now therefore divide this land for an inheritance unto the nine tribes and the half tribe of Manasseh with whom the Reubenites and the Gadites have received their inheritance which Moses gave them beyond Jordan eastward even as Moses the servant of the Lord gave them. Now the first part of this chapter deals with that promise. The Lord's promising that He's going to drive out all those people from before them there that remain in Canaan and He's telling Joshua go ahead and divide things up so that each tribe can take care of their particular settlement that belongs to them and, uh, and then after the promise, uh, you'll notice there uh, in verse 7 and verse 8, there's some things that deal with the previous decisions that's been made. And that's uh, speaking of half of Manasseh and the Reubenites and the Gadites in regards to their inheritance, uh, which they wanted. They wanted that, and Moses granted it to them, and that's beyond Jordan eastward. And just a side note for you in your study of the Bible, eastward is not a good direction. That's not a good direction. And you find out that that, uh, you know, I mean, that old phrase there, go west, young man, go west, that's, that's a principle in the Word of God. That's the layout of the, of the tabernacle. That's the direction of going towards the Lord. Going eastward is the other way. When they got kicked out of the garden, they went eastward. Amen. They got kicked out that direction. And, uh, and it's just, that's the way it goes. And these fellas, this is what happens for them. They, they want to live there, Right? Uh, Y'all remember that? Go to Numbers chapter 32. Look at Numbers chapter 32 and I'll wrap this up. 
He's talking about the promise. He's talking about those previous decisions. And he deals with the petitions all the way through chapter 17. Uh, talking about what belongs to each tribe there. And uh, things have been coasting for Israel and Joshua for a while. And now the rest is over. And it's time to get back after those enemies that are still within their borders. And those enemies, if they don't deal with them, they're going to grow. They're going to fortify. They're going to establish strongholds. Uh, that is the longer they're left there. <laughs> Amen. You've you got you to recognize the enemy. And you got to deal with him quick. And uh, Numbers 32, here's what happens with uh, Reuben and Gad and half of Manasseh as they look at that land over there. And this is way earlier. Numbers 32, verse 1. Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very a great multitude of cattle. When they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, uh, that behold, the place was a place for cattle. The children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spake unto Moses and to Eleazar the priest and unto the princes of the congregation, saying, and, and he mentions those names involved in all this. Skip to verse 4. Uh, Even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle, and thy servants have cattle. Wherefore said they, If we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for possession. And notice, and bring us not over Jordan. <laughs> That's what they wanted. We're happy right here. You know what they said? I mean, they've not even crossed Jordan at this point. Yeah. And they said, this is far enough right here. Hey, hey, Moses, we're pretty easy to please. I like it here. I don't want to go over there. I like the land right here. It's got everything we need right here. This is far enough. And look at Moses' response there, verse 6. And Moses said unto the children of Gad and the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war, and shall ye sit here? <laughs> Well, that'll preach, amen. Yeah. You know, you're, you got folks that, man, they, you got little old ladies, man. They're all by themselves. They've been widows for some of them for 40 years, and all they've got is a Bible and God. And they're drawn out of God, and they've learned a, the life of self denial, and they give faithfully. They send in their tithes. They, they live with God, they walk with God. And you and I think that we're just going to be just good old boys for Jesus and never deny ourselves. Never learn about taking up our cross and following after Christ. And we think we're just going to coast from here on out. And it's not going to happen. Amen. There, there are people, listen, they, they know what it took to live and walk with God. And it's going to be no different for you and I. Amen. And he says, shall your brethren go to war and shall you sit here? And wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord hath given them. And that's what happens, brethren. Amen. You get satisfied and that rubs off on a bunch of other people. Right. And what happens is they start measuring their life next to yours and you know next to you they look pretty good. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's what gets you into trouble. You know, well, next to him I'm alright. Then there comes some square head. He says, well next to you he looks alright. And you're putting out fire. Yeah. Amen. Other people are losing their interest in gaining their inheritance because you on the outside seem satisfied with a life of carnality. Yeah. That's what happens. That's what happens here. He says, why do you want to discourage your brethren? Why do you want to do this to them? Look there at verse, uh, uh, verse 8 there. Or excuse me. Drop down to verse 10. Verse 10. And the Lord's anger was kindled at the same time. And he swore, saying, Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt, Moses talking about this thing, from twenty years old and upward, shall see the land which I swear unto Abraham and unto Isaac and unto Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua the son of Nun. For they have wholly followed the Lord." What did Moses start doing? Moses started talking about that time there that he sent those spies into that land and those spies came back and discouraged the children of Israel and the Lord got angry with them except for Joshua and Caleb because Joshua and Caleb wholly followed the Lord. That pleased God. They were in it. Amen. They were in it. They were straight on. Yeah. They wholly followed the Lord and the rest of them the Lord got angry with. Now what's happened here is they've hit a sore spot with Moses. First of all, Moses don't get to cross that Jordan. <laughs> he don't get to go in that promised land. And he would give anything if he could. Yeah. Then also the sore spot exists because he was the victim of those spies and their evil report. Yeah. I mean, they spent all that time in the wilderness, him having to lead them around. Going and going and going and going and never getting anywhere. Because people wouldn't believe God. Right. People wouldn't pursue the Lord. And Moses had to put up with what the Bible says with their manners. <laughs> he suffered with their manners. 
And, and amen, God got them out of Egypt, but I mean, he had to die in the wilderness because he couldn't get Egypt out of them. Amen. And they just wandered around the rest of their days out there. And Moses lived with that mess. And now they're about to cross. And here comes somebody and says, we like it right here. <laughs> we just want to stop right. This is good enough. And boy, Moses got upset with him. And he said, are you going to sit here while your brethren go to war? And are you going to try to discourage their hearts like those spies discouraged them back then? And he begins to charge them. And he says down there, look at verse 18. They, they come to him and they, they've worked everything out. And they said to him, We will not return into our houses until the uh, children of Israel have inherited every man his inheritance. For we'll not inherit with them or yonder side Jordan or forward, because our inheritance has fallen unto us this side of Jordan eastward. And Moses said unto them, If ye will do this thing, if ye will go armed before the Lord to war, and will go all of you armed over Jordan before the Lord until he hath driven out his enemies from before him, and the land be subdued before the Lord, then afterward ye shall return. And be guiltless before the Lord and before Israel, and this land shall be your possession before the Lord. But if ye will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Now that sin that was going to find them out was the sin of going no farther. Amen. 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 The sin was, hey, if you don't go any further than where you're at right now, if you don't cross this Jordan and fight that enemy over there, you've sinned against the Lord and your sin's going to find you out. That's what he's telling them. Yeah. What is the sin? The sin is satisfied. Yeah. I've gone far enough. I'm happy right where I'm at. I'm okay. I'm fine. If I never grow another inch for the Lord, if I never do another thing for the Lord, I'm fine right now. And that sin, he said, will find you out. It'll hunt you down. That's what he's saying. They're ready to set up and settle down there. And because they, that is where they end up settling down. And that's addressed in Joshua chapter 1. It's addressed in what we looked at tonight there in chapter 13. You know what those tribes, as they go back to deal with that situation, they become a buffer zone. A buffer zone between the rest of the people of God and those folks down in Moab. And those folks down there in Edom there and the Ammonites. And because of that, when the enemies do finally invade the land, they attack right there. And some of them, they're the first to go. Because they're so close to the enemy. That's where they chose to set up. And because that's where they're at, they're vulnerable to the pagan practices of their neighbors. And they get polluted with all that stuff. And that's why they become the first to go when the enemy hits them. Because of where they chose to set up camp. Where they chose to, to enjoy their inheritance. Now, what that is, friend, is that's a picture of a borderline believer. <laughs> a borderline believer. They live on the edge and just try to stay distinct there, you know, and just awful close. But their fire for God is gone. Their fire for God is gone. Now listen, God, He's a consuming fire. And the, and the closer we get to Him, the more we start to catch on. <laughs> and you get a little closer and He gets a little more of you. And a little closer and he gets a little more of you. And that's the way it works out there until he's got you. Now let me say this in closing. Momentum. Momentum's good. And the Lord gives us those times of momentum. And thank God he does. I mean, he, that's what he told Elijah. He said, get up and eat. You've got to go on that meat for 40 days. And sometimes that's the way it is. Sometimes, boy, just a good meal from the Lord is going to be the last one you get for a while. And you got to go in that meat. you got to go in the strength of that meat for a while. And God gives some great light. And you got to go in that light for a while. And as you're going, God again eventually gives you more light. But you got to go in what He last told you for a while. That's part of living by faith. Man. And go in that strength for a while. And that encouragement for a while. Sometimes that's the way it is. It's not always on the mountaintop. Sometimes you're down in the valley and you're remembering what God showed you up there. <laughs> It was an old saying given to me a long time ago by a missionary. He said, never doubt in the night what God showed you in the light. <laughs> That's good. Because there's going to be nights. And you're going to be thinking back on what God told you that day. What, God, what light God gave you. What food God gave you. And you go in that momentum. You go in that strength. Sometimes, I mean, it just works out. There's, not, there's a time for a breather. There's a time for rest. But you better get back at it when the Lord says get back at it. Because if you don't, you may never get back at it again. Because at that point there that you start down that hill there, you're not going to go downhill forever. Pretty soon it starts uphill. And momentum 
can work against you. Now you're not only coasting to a stop, now the, everything else is pressing you back the other way. Yeah. And that's the way it works. The Lord says for a reason in 2 Peter chapter 1, beside all this, give all diligence to add to your faith. And He begins to talk about those things you're supposed to add. But He gives us instruction at the first, and He says, be diligent about it. Be diligent about it. Add to your faith. Amen. Work, work, work. Amen. Work for God. I'm not talking about your job. That's your hobby. 40-hour <laughs> week hobby. Some of you have 50 hours this week. Amen. Before it's over with. But that's not what you're here for. Amen. That's to provide for your family. Be thankful for it and do what you got to do. But Amen. you're here to serve God. Amen. You're here to please the Lord Jesus Christ. And you got to go on that strength and you need all the momentum you can have. Amen. And then when you start to you start to sense it, you better pick back up and go after it. Amen. You better be sensitive to the Spirit of God. You better not have the mindset of getting out of work. Amen. You better have the mindset of being refreshed to get back to work. Because of work, that's important. And the walk with God, that's important. You can lose momentum in that. And you don't want to. Because you lose momentum and all those enemies that you left within the borders of your life, the longer they stay, the stronger they get. And after a while they get a stronghold and you may never get them out because you didn't want to get started back. Walking with God. Going in that light, going in that strength, and you lose that momentum. Momentum can work against you. Eventually it goes the other way. Amen. It's good when God comes in and revives you and gives you something to get you going. But you don't want to just quit working at that point. You don't want to quit walking with God at that point. Amen. You want to go in that strength. You want to go in that strength. And there may come a time when the Lord says, Come apart and rest. Amen. You, know, you need to. You need to come apart and rest. But then he'll say, get back at it. <laughs> and you better get back at it. <laughs> because there's a lot of folks, they stopped. When they, got to mo when they got to that momentum, they could coast for a while. they just going to coast from here on out. It's what they thought. And they didn't. <laughs> Amen. Nobody coasts from here on out. You know the truth is about claiming Canaan? It's never through. You're not, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved. Again, doesn't matter how much of your Bible you've read, what you know doctrinally, how many souls you've won to Christ, it makes no difference at all. There remaineth much land to be possessed. And there's a narrow window that we have to get it done. And we need to reach and get it.